Good evening. It's so good to see each and every one that has decided to come here on tonight. To our visitors, or thank you all for being out as we sing praises to our great God and hear a portion of his word. Tonight, I want to invite you all to turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, is, one of, is going to be one of our main texts tonight regarding the topic on the last days. Now, for many that are here that are members uh, are aware that at the beginning of this year, I started this preaching internship here at the university. Where Brother Josh and JP and Steve have collectively uh, been doing what they can to help me to uh, better equip me with the necessary tools and skills and becoming a more effectual gospel preacher. And I have God to thank for such great men and all that they, the wisdom and the knowledge that they possess. But I also have you all to thank for all the help and all the support that you have shown me. That you all have shown me God's love. But not only me, but you've shown my fiance Olivia, my sister Kaya, my mother Shalandria. The love that you've shown each other. It is a love that not only I see, but those inside the church and outside the church see it as well. It is a love that we all ought to continue to strive to show one another. And we'll see why, kind of why that is the case in, these, uh, in this text. You look in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. This is where Paul is talking to his son Timothy in the faith. He would send this second letter to Timothy while he was in prison. This would have likely been his last letter before his death. He says in chapter 1, for Timothy to guard his trust. You look in verse 5 of that chapter, he talks about this sincere faith that would have been in Timothy's grandmother. It would have been on down to his mother, and Paul would have been sure that this sincere faith was in Timothy as well. And so he says, Timothy, guard this. You look in chapter 2, he tells Timothy to be strong. In verse 1, you, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 3, suffer hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Verse 12, endure. Verse 15, be diligent. You know, it seems as if Paul is building Timothy up for a, a sort of thing that he's about to tell Timothy about. And sure, we can see that thing in these uh, other chapters, but he kind of gives it all in chapter 3. He says, Timothy, I mean, he, he's, go, he's telling Timothy to guard his trust. In chapter 2, Timothy, be strong. Well, why? Why is that the case? Look at the topic for tonight. It's regarding the, uh, something that I've come to hear in my days is that people, they're saying things like, well, we are now living in the last days, that Jesus is about to come. And we see all these different signs and things that are happening. So we are in the last days. This is what I'm hearing nowadays. This is this phrase that we are now living in the, in the last days is something that has been a popular saying for some time now. Again, people are looking at these different signs and things that are happening around the world and say that, well, Jesus is about to come again, that the world is about to end. You know, they look at the wars and the rumors of it that are going on. Catastrophic events like uh, famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. They say that these are all signs that Jesus is coming again, that the world is about to end. And right before Jesus comes, the son of perdition, who is the Antichrist, will finally reveal himself. That people will receive the mark of the beast, being 666. Six, six. Now these are all references from the Bible. But I don't believe they are to be looked at as signs that will lead to us knowing exactly when Jesus will return. 
And what should all suffice us is the answer that he gives us in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, where he says, but of that day, an hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. Now, with all that being said, what I do want to look at concerning the last days is in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Not that these are signs of Jesus' second coming, but as things that are going on right now. Read me starting in verse 1 of chapter 3, if you will. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such man. Now, you look in verse 1 here, the term difficult means to something that is hard to do or to bear. You know, the New King James Version will say that in these last days, these difficult times will come, or these perilous times will come. The ESV Version says the times of difficulty. And in verse 1, Paul says that in the last days, these times of difficulty will come. And again, that word last days is one I believe that is misunderstood by many in the world today. Again, these people are looking at things and they're referencing things that are happening in our world. You know, we see the war going on with uh, with Russia and Ukraine, with Israel and Palestine. There's even rumors of World War III concerning pestilences. Well, when the COVID-19 virus broke out, you know, people were all coming to God, which was not necessarily a bad thing, but they were doing it for the very fact. Well, these were all signs that Jesus is about to come again, that the world is about to end, that we are living in the last days. But what I believe many fail to realize that the term last days is in reference to a different age. If you remember, and you can go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2 really quick. If you remember on the day of Pentecost when God would have poured out his spirit upon the apostles. And as he would pour out his spirit upon the apostles, we understand that the, uh, the... The eleven there, they would have uh, spoken with cloven tongues and that all the Jews that were around, they would have uh, they would have heard these apostles speaking in their native tongue, the wonderful works of God. And there were some that would have supposed that, well, these apostles were, were drunk. Peter stands up among them and says, well, no, that is not the case. In verse 16, but this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. You see that wording last days is used and Peter's saying, well, this is that. Denoting that, well, even Peter and them, they were living in the last days. You look in another chapter, uh, you look in another book in Hebrews chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, it will use that same wording there. It will say, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, has spoken to us. In his son. Again, that wording there is used. And the reason why I say this is that many fail to realize that the term last days is in reference to a different age. That at one point the world was in the patriarchal age, and then from there the mosaic age. And after that, the third, the final, the last days or age, well, the messianic age. So, yes, we are living in the last days, but we have been for some time now. And so now that we kind of uh, got a grasp on that and understand that, well, 
The point is, is that we are living in the last days and that difficult times, they're not coming, but they are here. What makes it so difficult? Verse two, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful. You know, we won't take all the time to break down each individual characteristic, but I think it's important to note that these are very interesting. Not that these are interesting because of what these men are, but rather where they are. It's obvious for many, if not all, of these characteristics to be applied and assigned to different individuals out into the world, out that are in the world. We see narcissism, we see all these different things, selfish, greed, all these things we turn on the news, we see it out in the world all the time. But I believe that Paul is referring specifically to those men, there will be some that are in the church. That in the last days, men will deeply cherish themselves, that they will deeply cherish money, that they'll be boastful or impostors, one who loudly flaunts himself, who thinks he's self-sufficient and that he, has, he doesn't need anyone else. Arrogant or proud, revilers or blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful or unthankful. You know, it's difficult, it's hard to bear, it's hard to see these things because, well, these are people, these are some that are in the church that are like this. You know, you look at that last word in verse 2, unholy. Well, the reason why that's so difficult to, to understand, difficult to see, is because, well, there are people that are out in the world, yeah, they're unholy, but if you're looking for anybody to be holy, well, uh, if you're looking for anybody to practice holiness, well, look in the church. We understand from passages like 1 Peter chapter 1 where it talks about, you know, for, that we ought to be holy as our Father is holy. But in the last days, there will be those that are unholy. That's hard to picture. That's hard to bear. Verse 3, unloving. Some of your translations may say without natural affection. You know, the love that a parent would have had, uh, would have for their child, the love that a brother would have for his sister. You know, that is just something natural. But in the last days, there will be those that are unloving, irreconcilable, those that are unforgiving. They don't want to be reconciled with their brother. Malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, Reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Paul tells Timothy to avoid these types of individuals, denoting that, again, they too were in, they were living in the last days. This is not something that is just happening today, as pe many people may think. Oh, well, we are now living in the last days. This has been going on. This is nothing new. Even in Paul and Timothy's time. That we've seen this happening. He says these people, they hold to a, a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Picking up in verse 6, he says, for, um, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I mean, you can't help but to think of the imagery of a wolf in sheep clothing. That, you know, we, for the most part, we would recognize those that are out in the world that, would, that we would invite into our house. You know, we may call them friends, but, you know, we tend to keep our guard up. We tend to be strong. We tend to uh, guard our trust because they are not of the faith. And if they ever ask a question about the faith, well, we are ready to give an answer according to every person that asks us the reason for the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. But what about if we invite a brother or sister in Christ into our household? You know, I'm not saying we don't throw our faith out the window, but we tend to be in a more lax position because we assume that we both have the same faith. That we both believe in the same God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. 
And this is why it's really dangerous when this happens, because these people, it says that they creep into households. And we, if we assume this and we are not careful, then we can be led away by what they are talking about. You know, this is not just picking uh, on women, it's, but it's for all those that are uh, unlearned or unprepared. You know, Peter, if you turn to Second Peter chapter 2, he deals with this same, uh, this same thing here. That the, he said in his days, uh, when, in their days, you know, the rise of false prophets will be a thing. In verse 1 of Second Peter chapter 2, he would say, but false prophets also arose among the people. Just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Verse 2, many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. You go back to the text, it always uh, it talks about in verse 7 that there are those that were always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, denoting that there is one truth, there is one knowledge. But there will be those that will come and try to disrupt all of that, that they will try to malign the truth. And if we're not careful, then we can follow their pernious ways. Their disruptive ways. Paul will go on to uh, bring about two individuals here. He says in verse 8, Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind, reject in regard to the faith. He says that, well, these men here, they were uh, examples of this. Now, this we, we don't read about anywhere else in the Bible, about these two individuals in particular. But these two would have been known by the Jews that they would have resisted Moses back in Egypt. And it is known to be that these were magicians that would have been under Pharaoh. And that, yes, while they were under Pharaoh, well, they, well, they sought their own good. And they would do things to take advantage of others. That they would oppose the truth, that they would oppose Moses as he's bringing about truth. Paul compares these people that are uh, in the last days, he compares them to those back then. Difficult times are here. But he would go on to say even then in verse 9, but they will not make further progress. For their folly will be obvious to all just as Janus's and Jambres's folly was also. That yes, difficult times are here, but this folly can be seen. That there is a silver lining amidst the difficulty and opposition, and that is what we need to understand, that there is a silver lining that shines. You look in the next verse that Paul reminds Timothy of his own struggles that Timothy himself would have heard and seen. Verse 10, now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, verse 11, and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. And there's, the silver lining is right there that, you know, Paul, he went through these different things. He endured, and we understand that Paul, well, he went through a lot of different persecutions. But he confidently says, well, the Lord has delivered me from them all, through them all. If you turn to Acts chapter 14, we'll see one of the uh, times where he is severely persecuted, rather. In Acts chapter 14, picking up in verse 19, this is on his first missionary journey. You know, he's going, preaching the gospel. And in verse 19 of Acts chapter 14, it says, but Jews 
came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. But while the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. The next day he went away with Barnabas to Derbe. After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Again, there is a silver lining here. He says, yes, we are going to have tribulations. You know, Paul was just stoned to a point where people thought that he was dead. But again, the Lord delivered him. There is that silver lining there. And after he's going, after he's going back to these different cities and he's encouraging the brethren, well, he says through much tribulation, we must enter the kingdom of God. Well, the silver lining is, is that we can enter the kingdom of God. We can enter the kingdom of God. That is great. That is a silver lining, one that we can hope uh, to be with God one day. If we continue on, even through these tribulations, even through all these things that come about, we can enter the kingdom of God. You know, you look back in the text, we'll see this promise here, one that uh, not many people like to hear about. In verse 12, he says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You know, you look at why this is the case. He goes on in verse 13, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. That yes, this world is just going to continue on in this spiral of evil going on. That there's going to be persecution. There's going to be people that are haters of good. There's tribulation. There's trouble. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That this world is going to go from bad to worse. And sure, we, we, we pray for the world. We pray for our nation to get better. And we believe, you know, in the things that we pray for, that one day it will get better. But in all reality, that a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people just like how they are. And, all, and again, it's a promise that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That this spiral of evil out in the world, it gets to the point where it even comes to influence some that are in the church. To the point, again, where, again, we're living in the difficult times, that these people that are uh, lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, these are not just people out in the world. But if we're not careful, these are people that are in the church. So Paul warns Timothy of the importance of the word of God. You look in verse 14. As all these things is happening, a man is going from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy, cling to the word that was taught to you since you were a child. You know, I think it's important to note the example that Timothy's grandmother and mother would have set. And they, they didn't just send Timothy off to some school or send him off to the synagogues to learn the scriptures, but they themselves were great examples of those that had that sincere faith. You see that in verse 5 of uh, chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. But well, Paul says, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, Timothy, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am sure that is in you as well. So we see that his parents had a big impact in who, uh, what man he has become even today. 
And so he's telling Timothy, what? Continue in sound doctrine. Continue in what you have been taught, the sacred writings, which is able to point you to Jesus, which is able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Why is that? Why is these scriptures so important? Well, the famous text is in Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, where many of us can quote that all scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And so what does this all mean for us? Well, again, going back to the time that we are living in, you know, what time is it? Not saying, you know, the time, oh, it's 543. No, but what time is it? We are living in the last days. Difficult times are here, and that is something that we need to understand, that these times won't be easy. It will be hard to bear because many, uh, because mainly where these men are, that they're not just out into the world, but there are some that are in the church. And so we have to be mindful. We have to continue to uh, be aware of our surroundings. That men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Why is this such a problem? Well, this is contrary to God's love because Jesus came to serve others. We understand that from Philippians chapter 2, that he would have put others before himself. And we ought to do that same thing. But there are those, rather, that will be lovers of themselves instead of loving others. He says that there will be those that will be lovers of money. Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, Paul talks about that very thing. That there were those that loved money. And we understand it says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And he says, by some, by longing it for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There are those that will be ungrateful or unthankful. Why is that such a bad thing? Romans chapter 1 verse 21 will really testify to that. That if we aren't thankful to God, then we can become futile in speculation and our foolish heart can be darkened. All for not being thankful. There are those that will be unloving, without natural affection, as some translations will say. A love that a parent would have for their child. And I wonder an example of that would be a mother aborting her baby. A father neglecting his child. A brother or a son or daughter's lack of concern for their parents or a brother's lack of concern for his sister. There are those that are irreconcilable or unforgiving. They don't want to be uh, reconciled to their brother. They don't want to be forgiving. Well, that goes against everything that God would want. God wants us to be forgiving. You know, we forgive because he forgave us. We need to be reconciled. But there are those that are irreconcilable. These people are not just out in the world. They have crept into the church. That They will come after the weak. Those that are unprepared. Those that are not grounded in truth, in the knowledge, in the truth. So we ought to be careful. We need to be strong in the grace of God and to guard our trust because we are living in difficult times. But even so, amidst all of these, again, there is a silver lining that shines for us. You turn to Mark chapter 10, you'll look at a couple of promises here. And this is where Jesus is talking to his disciples here. In Mark chapter 10, we're going to begin in verse 29. And this is where at first Jesus is talking uh, and the rich young ruler would come up and he would say, well, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And after Jesus tells him what he needs to do, well, he goes away. 
And then Peter says, well, we have left everything. What, 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 what's in it for us? Verse 29, Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake. Verse 30, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms. You know, we see the promise of a family that this is a great promise. And this is one that I've come to experience myself, even here at university. Again, the love that you have shown me and my family. It's a promise that I see that Jesus has promised. And it's one that I've come to know and experience. Jesus promises us a family. You know, we see the provisions of God here that God will provide. But you even go on in that same verse after he's talking about the children and the farms and all this and that. He says, along with it is persecutions. That Yes, there is a silver lining that shines. But again, these persecutions are, are, are still here that they are going to happen. But in the end, it says in that same verse, and in the age to come, eternal life. That is something we strive to look forward to, that yes, these promises of a family, provisions of God, that these are great promises, but there will be these persecutions. But again, if we continue on, we look forward to a new life. We look forward to a new place. But well, we have that promise. And we ought to continue on in the faith, that we ought to continue in sound doctrine. We need to cling to the word even in these last days. You know, you go back to where Paul was talking to Timothy. You know, he was saying that he was taught the scripture since he was a child. Well, what does that mean for us, for those with parents? When is it too early? To teach your children. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he grows older, he will not abandon it. So again, we are living in the last days. That difficult times are here. But even amidst of all those difficulties, there is a silver lining that shines. And even as all these things are happening, all these persecutions are happening, we just need to continue in sound doctrine, continue in the teaching. Why? Because all scripture is inspired by God. You know, I talked about Brother Steve and Josh and JP and all that they have uh, equipped me with, the tools and the skills and that what they're doing to continue to work with me. Well, Josh and uh, Steve, they have me uh, looking at a couple different books which are good and which have really been helping me. But at the end of the day, this is the only one that is inspired by God. And this is the only one where I will be able to learn to uh, reprove, rebuke, correct, and instruct in righteousness. Because it is inspired by God, it is something that we all need to continue to strive to look to, to uh, do these things, to combat these people that are living in the last days, because again, we are living in difficult times. So with all that said, well, the foundation is the word. That we ought to continue in it. That we ought to cling to it. That there are those today that will try to come and disrupt that foundation. And if we're not careful, if we're not grounded in the word, then we can be carried away. But again, all those that cling to the word of God will overcome in the last days. Now, there will come a time where there will be a literal last day. It's not talking about a different age, but that there will be a literal last day where Jesus will come and the world will end. We don't know when. Again, the Father only knows. But what we can do to prepare is to look to what God has given us. We understand that he has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. 
And see, we ought to take the things that he has commanded us to do and continue on to teach our kids, to teach uh, anyone that we really come in contact with when we have that opportunity and to live that out in our day to day lives. If you have not put on Jesus Christ, if you have not obeyed the gospel call again, we are living in the last days and there will come a literal last day. And the question is, well, will you be ready to meet your maker? Put your faith in Jesus. Repent of your wrongdoings. Confess him as Lord. We understand that this world, again, is going from bad to worse, that there's this spiral of evil that's going to continue to come. And so save yourself from this untoward generation. Put Jesus on in baptism and come up out of that grave, a new creature in Christ Jesus. And if you have obeyed the gospel call and you find yourself living in these difficult times and it's really difficult to where you're you're falling and you even find yourself maybe in one of these categories and you need help or you need the prayers of the church. And whatever your need may be, let us help you. We are all striving to practice holiness, to practice righteousness, to practice Christ in our own lives. Whatever your need may be, won't you come down to the front as we all together stand and sing the song of invitation? I am resolved.